uh, Galatians 3, if you want to look there, in verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? False doctrine at its core is witchcraft. Because it places an earthly requirement in order to get God to do something in your life. And that's a lie. God doesn't need one thing from you other than a broken heart. Broken and a contrite heart. Tears, your tears, God saves in a bottle as a reminder to him of what you're going through. And um, that's what the Bible says. So, O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you, has uh, witchcraft is in Jefferson County. It is manifested in a multitude of places and it is manifested in churches in this county. I learned something this week. I, I talked about it during Sunday school. I'm not going to talk about it now. It's not, the, not, I don't feel really led. It's not the time of the place. But I'm telling you, we are surrounded as a church in this county. We are surrounded with Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth in the churches in this area. We're surrounded. We're surrounded by the drunkards of Ephraim who have been drinking from the vine of Sodom. We are surrounded by that. And... The only way for us as a church to, and you as an individual to not turn over to that is to allow the Word of God to correct you, to chastise you, to humble you, and to bring you to righteousness. It has to happen this way. I don't, I don't, I don't know of any other way to do it. Galatians 5 verse 16, This I say then, I want you to pay attention to what he's saying here. This I say then, walk in the Spirit... And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is going to be made true this morning in this message. For the lust for the flesh lusteth against the spirit. The spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that ye would. And what that means is your spirit wants to do right. Your flesh prohibits your spirit from doing right. That's what that means. So that you cannot do the things that you would. The word would is a will word. It is related to your will. When you say I will do this and I will do that, the word would means I would have done that. I, that's part of my will. In Romans 7, Paul, he uses that word would, and he said that, that I allow, that what I do, I allow not, but what I allow, that I do not, he said I would have done it. It's in my will. But my flesh kept me from it. And let me tell you something, your flesh is always rebellious. That's where I'm going with this message. Your flesh is always rebellious against the Word of God and the will of God wanting to be manifested in your life, your flesh hates it and says, I'm not doing it. That's your flesh. So, verse 18, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Meaning that when you crucify the will of your flesh, you will not be under the condemnation of the law. You know why? Because you'll be doing right. You'll be doing what's right in God's eyes. So verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. And I'm tell you something. This Bible's right. This Bible's right. I'm going to, I don't have this. I would put it up on the screen. I found something last night. I shared it with a couple of people. It just, to me, it makes the Bible right. Did you know the Bible talks about sea monsters? Did you know that? The word sea monsters, is that phrase is actually in your King James Bible, sea monsters. Now, everybody says sea monsters are a myth. It's made up, they're not real, and, anybody, and if the Bible says that, obviously it's wrong, it doesn't mean that. And what it says about sea monsters is they draw out the breast. It actually says that a certain type of sea monster has breast that feeds its young. I am not aware... Of any sea creature that does that. 
So that must be something not translated right in my Bible. No. There is, I saw a, one of these drawings. Now I've got it. I'm, I pro, I'll probably show it tonight now that I opened my mouth. Ancient seagoing men drew pictures of what they saw at sea hundreds of years ago. One guy drew a picture of a sea monster with breasts. So the Bible says that they have them. There's a picture of one. And I'm going to show it tonight. This Bible's right. This Bible is not wrong in anything that it says. I don't care what the oceanographers say. I don't care what the evolutionists say. I don't care what the geologists say. I don't care what the physicists say. I don't care what uh, Albert Einstein said. I do not care what the smartest people in the world say. Their wisdom is foolishness when it comes to the word of God. They don't know what they think they know. So this Bible is right. The works of the flesh are going to be manifested in your life. You are proving what you are. You are. You're proving it. Because if these things are in you, they will manifest. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That was one sermon. Idolatry. That was two sermons I preached on that. Now witchcraft. I'm going to preach a message on witchcraft. And then you can mark it down. I'm going to preach a message on hatred. That's going to be tough. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. Roy, I'm going to preach a message on drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, and I've now said this now in four messages, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It will not happen. The Father, help me to preach this message with authority. Help me to preach it without apology. I have everything to lose. I have everything to gain. So Lord, I might as well just preach it and let you deal with whoever you're going to deal with. Father, I love this church. I love these people. But in some ways, our ways are not right in your eyes. And I include myself in that. So Father, I need it. Just as bad as anybody else. I dare not preach out of pride or ego or arrogance. So, Father, help me preach with humility, but help me to preach with authority. Help me to love these people as I love myself. And Father, I care about myself. I care about how I turn out. I care about where I go and where I spend eternity. And Lord, help me to care about my neighbors here the way I care about myself. So Father, this message will be about restoration and not condemnation. And Father, help me to preach it in love. Help me to preach it right. And may the Holy Ghost say on the inside what it is that I'm saying on the outside. Let there be a double witness. And Father, you preach the message today and deal with our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let me show you something up on the screen. In Exodus 22, verse 18, God said, Thou shalt not suffer a wit. The word suffer means allow. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. God was dead serious about this. And let me just tell you something. There are two religions in the world. And only two. There is Bible Christianity and witchcraft. And every other religion in the world. You name it. It has a form of witchcraft in it. And witchcraft in, in, its, in, it, in the breakdown of it is. Witchcraft says 
that it requires things of this world and it requires the person practicing it to depend on the things of this world and to depend upon their own words and their own will in order to get the forces or in order to get a God to bring them what it is that they want. In other words, it, it, here's, here's what it looks like in churches. In churches, they'll, they'll, have a, they'll have a little praise deal and they'll say, okay, now we're going to face west. Now we're going to face east. Now we're going to face north. Now we're going to face south. And if we do these things, then God will, will bless us if we do. In other words, it says if we perform certain rituals or we say the right words, then God will be forced to give us what it is that we're asking. And if you're asking something from God and he's not giving it to you, then obviously it's your fault. You're not saying the words right or you're not facing in the right direction or you don't have your knees bent at the right angle or there's something in your life that's blocking God's blessing in your life. That's a bunch of garbage. Listen, every, everything in my life ought to, bless, ought to block God from working in my life. Everything about me ought to prevent God from doing one good thing in me. In me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And I, in my flesh, am not capable of pleasing God with what I do and what I say in my flesh. God is blessing me by grace. Not because I did the right thing, not because I said the right thing, not because I faced the right direction, or I was laying down, or I was standing up, or I gave large sums of money, or I attended large amounts of church services, or whatever it is. You are blessed by God's love and by God's grace and nothing else. And anybody that says anything else, that's witchcraft. So when the Catholic priest tells you, now you've got to come down, see that spot right there on the carpet? You've got to come down to that spot on the carpet. That's called the, um, there's a transept and every Catholic, every Catholic church looks like a cross. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. But when the priest gives you the little cookie, he's got to do so at that spot on the carpet. Did you know that? Right there. In the little center point where the two parts of the cross comes together, that's where the priest gives the cookie. When they do a funeral, where do they put the casket? In that same spot. Everything about a church, the Catholic church says, it has to be done right here and nowhere else. That's witchcraft. If you're a Catholic, they will not do your funeral at a funeral home. It must be done in a Catholic church. That's witchcraft. You can have my funeral out in the parking lot for all I care. Roll me down the hill. Put me in the grave. I'll be in heaven. Smiling. The books that you see up on the screen are books. They're very popular. In fact, here's some more. Most of these books are written for children. Primarily for young girls. The target of practicing witchcraft in America is the female adolescent between the ages of 8 and 12 years old. Or they could get them later on. There's a book here called Teen Witch. It is designed... There, and the testimony of one of the girls in this book is my mom and daddy, my daddy's a deacon in a church and I started practicing witchcraft and now my daddy and mommy are okay with it. It is bloating in America. This book over here on your left is called The Girl's Guide to Spells. Lisa and I saw that at a, one of the mall bookstores, and it was right at eye level for about an eight or nine year old girl. It's pink and pretty and got stars. It was designed to attract young girls to buy this book, read it, and learn how to cast spells. And our churches are full of witchcraft. Do you believe that? In fact, 
I went to Google Images and I typed in witchcraft books. And that's not even the tip of the iceberg on the number of books that are available to every market to push witchcraft on the American people. It is evil on the rise. In 1963, things began to change in America. Who remembers? Where were you in 62? I wasn't born yet. Who remembers not in the 60s? Who remembers the change that took place? Ron, you remember the change that took place in the 60s? I'm going to show you something in a minute. In 1963, the Supreme Court expelled prayer and the Bible out of our schools. That was the beginning of it. Our nation lost its innocence when our president was assassinated in 1963. First presidential assassination covered on the news. People, back in 63, they didn't have quite the CNN stuff that they have now. But you probably remember Walter Cronkite announcing live... President Kennedy had died at 1 p.m. That's 1,300 hours, by the way. Our youth were overrun. From 1963 on, our youth were overrun with marijuana, LSD, heroin, etc. Am I right? Sexual freedom was replacing biblical roles in marriage from 1963 on. Am I right? An explosion of New Age, Eastern mysticism, and witchcraft in America, 1963 on. Started with the Beatles. By the year, what, what year did the Beatles come to America? 63. These were the immediate replacements of the Bible in American society. Right up here on the screen is a picture of the average American family in 1960. Does that look about right? Ron, does that look about right? The average American family taking a family portrait in 1960. Just 10 years later, that's what it turned into. In 10 years time, 1960 to 1970, the American youth, boys started growing their hair long, women started wearing their skirts up, wearing their short shorts, wearing their halter tops, right? Free love was everywhere, teen girls were out getting pregnant, everywhere. And then marriage started its decline from the 1960s on. Do you think God knew why these things were taking place? I know. It is because in the 60s, the American family and the American schools and the American churches started discarding their Bibles. They're King James Bibles. You don't think I'm right? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18. I'm going to give you the proof. By the way, I'm going to preach this whole message. Okay? It's raining out. You don't need to go out to your car now anyway. So I'm going to pray that it'll rain until I get done with the message. Deuteronomy 18 verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. By the way, 1960s, 19, 1972, 1973, legalized abortion. In this, the 60s were the setup to legalize abortion. The court would not have legalized the murder of innocent children before the 60s. The 60s were the setup. 
That's making your son or daughter to pass through the fire. You know what abortion is in relation? You know why they made their sons to pass through the fire? Do you know why they threw their babies on a burning altar? For the betterment of themselves. It was to appease the gods so that they would be blessed. What is 99% of the abortions in this country for? The betterment of the mom who doesn't want to deal with the pregnancy. If she didn't want to deal with the pregnancy, she shouldn't have laid down for that boy. It's not the baby's fault that you weren't ready to carry that child. If you were ready to lay down for that boy, then you should have been ready to carry that child. You're not to have your children pass through the fire. Anybody that uses divination or an observer of times, that's astrology or an enchanter. That is praise and worship music. That's 90% of praise and worship music in the church is repetitive chants. Which Jesus told us not to do what the heathen do. And keep repeating over and over the chants. And make those prayers and repeat them uh, and use rep vain repetitions he called it. He said for they think they can be heard for their much speaking. speaking. God doesn't care how many times you prayed the prayer. That rhymes. That's just an accident by the way. You can write that down and make out a bumper sticker. Or a witch. Or a charmer. Or a consulter with familiar spirits. Or a wizard. Or a necromancer. By the way, when you pray to St. Mary, that's a familiar spirit. When you pray to St. Joseph and St. Who's It and St. What's It, those are familiar spirits. You're not a consult with them. Uh-oh, the alarm's going off. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> or a wizard or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. God does not want you doing that. So you know what that means? If God moved the Canaanites out for doing those things, and the Israelites did those things, then God moved the Israelites out of His land for doing those things. So you know what that means? If God moved somebody out of your pew for doing those things, and you came in and sat down in their pew, and now you're doing it, you mark it down. God's going to move you out and put somebody in that will worship Him. Second Chronicles 33. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. But he did that which evil, was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Now I made a list of all the things that Manasseh did. You can follow along in your Bible. I encourage you to. You look up on the screen. Here's the list. For he built again the high places. He reared up altars for Balaam. He made groves, worshiped all the host of heaven, and served them. He also, he built altars in the house of the Lord. And he built altars for all the host of heaven. And he caused his children to pass through the fire. He also observed times. He used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. All of these things are religious acts. These are the things that he did. The 13 things that he did is what caused him to do the 14th thing. And the 14th thing was he put an idol in the temple in the most holy place. Remember what I said last Sunday about hiding idols? Where would you hide them? That's the most holy place. You hide them in your heart. You didn't just get there overnight. You built up to it. So this number 13, let me give you this number here real quick. In Nahum, chapter 3, the Bible says, Woe to the bloody city, it is full of lies and robbery. 
The prey departeth not, the noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and the prancing of horses and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear and there's a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses because it, this is why they got so many dead people. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of what? So whenever witchcraft is around, there's a certain spirit that is around that is causing that or is behind that. Her name is 13 words. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. There can only be two spirits in an individual's life, in a home, in a family, in a church, or in a country. It's either going to be the Holy Spirit or it's going to be Mystery Babylon spirit. When there's witchcraft, it's Mystery Babylon. It's not the Holy Spirit. You say, why are you giving us all this? Here's what's interesting. Did you know that Wicca, which is witchcraft, actually has 13 rules? Imagine that. By the way, 13, where is it? I thought I had this verse here. In uh, Genesis 14, it says something about a nation in its 13th year rebelled. So 13 is a number for rebellion. And it's the, name, it's the number for Mystery Babylon the Great. She is always the spirit of rebellion. Now here's what, I'm, here's what I'm getting at. Principle number six in Wicca is, we do not recognize any authoritarian hierarchy. Do you know what that means? That if you're a, if you're a Wiccan, nobody is your boss. If you practice Wicca or witchcraft, nobody is in authority over you. Nobody is. Not your boss at work. Not law enforcement. Not a judge. Not a church. Not a husband. You do not recognize any authority, including this. Do you know where I'm going? Because here's what's interesting. 1 Samuel 15, 23. Turn there. In fact, there's that verse I was looking at. Twelve years they served Cater Laomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. Turn to 1 Samuel 15. This is what Samuel said to King Saul. First Samuel 15, 23, are you there? For rebel I want you to underline this in your Bible. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Are you listening? Wives. Wives. Submit to your husbands. Am I wrong? Does that mean you got to let them beat you? No. There are limits. God recognizes those limits. I recognize those limits. Do I have to listen to him? Do I have to, do I have to submit to him if he's lost? The Bible gives no such condition. My mother had a responsibility to live a godly life in front of my dad and recognize that dad was the head of the family. And according to uh, First Peter, if a wife does that, then there's a good chance her husband might get saved. And that's what happened with my dad. Wives, submit to your husbands, children. 
Obey your parents, for this is right. Children, when your parents say do this and you don't do it, what is that? It's witchcraft. It's rebellion. Workers, when the boss or the manager says do this and you say, I don't got to do that, that's stupid. That's witchcraft. That's rebellion. Do you know this Bible tells you as a servant to obey your master? That means if you're at work and the boss says do this, now there are limits. The boss says do this and it's illegal. Obviously don't do it. I get that. The boss says do this and it endangers somebody, then obviously there are limits. But 99% of the time, a boss or a manager is not going to tell you to do something that's illegal or that's dangerous. He's going to tell you to do something. Do it. Right? Church members. If the Bible says do something, do it. Now, in this case, the Bible is never going to tell you to do something illegal, immoral, wicked, hurtful, or any such thing. So if the Bible tells you, do this, and you don't do it, what is that? It's rebellion. It's witchcraft. And God hates it. God hates it. I'll give you an example. God told Joseph, God set up Joseph to be the savior of his brethren. So when they were starving to death, they come down to Egypt. Joseph revealed himself, said, I've got food. Won't you come down and live down here? So God brought the children of Israel down to live in Egypt. 400 years later, they have a Pharaoh that wants, wants, is, he's just trying to be mean to them, so he puts them in bondage. Did you know that God never at one time told any of the Israelites, you do not have to listen to Pharaoh? God never said that. God never said that. God did not tell Moses, Moses, go get Israel. Pharaoh can just go jump. We're leaving. God never did that. God told Moses, say to Pharaoh, let my people go. That's authority. And God is always in authority. It's not, if it's rebellion, God is not in it. So Saul, watch this. Saul, when he first was anointed king, did you know that he preached? Did you know that he prophesied? Did you know that he, he sounded like he was a Baptist preacher? That he started out doing good. But then, he made the decision. Not God, not Samuel. Saul made the decision on what part of what God said that he would obey and what part he wouldn't obey. You caught that? What that means is, you do not have a right to choose and pick what part of the Bible you're going to live by and what part you're not. So, can you decide, if you're a Christian, can you decide that you can drink beer and wine and it be okay, even though the Bible says it's not? Can you decide to do that? You can't decide to do that. If God said don't do it, you can't, you can't decide that you can do it and still be okay with God. That's witchcraft. That's rebellion. If God says to the ladies, ladies dress modest. Now how many sermons in 22 years have I preached demanding that you wear certain things? How many? But you know what's modest. 
I know what's modest, and we all know what is immodest. And when you dress immodest, and God says to dress modest, you can't pick and choose what part of the Bible you're going to live by and what part you're not going to live by. Should go on? You don't want me to. There are parts of this Bible, well, the whole thing. You cannot decide that you are going to keep part of God's word and reject part of God's word. That's what Saul did. And what happened when, when Samuel said, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, guess where Saul ended up? You remember her name? What was her name, Jody? Endora. Where did they get that name? The witch at Endor that Saul went and consulted with because God wouldn't talk to him anymore. That Bible's right. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. I'm telling you, there's a church, if I could remember the name, I'd go ahead and say it. There's a church in Jefferson County, Lindsay put, put me on to them this week, they have two women that are admitted wives to each other, raising a child, those two, and one of those women was a former student in our Christian school, and we had her suspicions back then that she was queer. Found out that she is, and she attends this church, and she goes up there, and they let her and her wife help out with the vacation Bible school. Here, teach our children. That's witchcraft. That's rebellion. And I've listened to the sermons in that church. God will not talk to them. God will not speak to them. They have rejected God's word, and there is no word. A whole church. That God will not speak to anymore. So what happens in a church when God quits talking to the church? It's replaced with witchcraft. Now that's happened to a whole church. Do you think that could happen to you? Do you think it could happen to you? Where God would finally say to you, I'm done talking to you. And then God says, when I'm done talking to you, by the way, I'm done forgiving you. Because if you won't let me speak, then I will not forgive your sins anymore. And that's exactly what happened to Saul. This is what has happened to America and this is what happens to anyone who will not let, not let God talk. Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defenses is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. That was Joshua and Caleb to the Israelites. He said, rebel ye not against the Lord. You know what Israel did? They rebelled against the word of the Lord and they died. And God said, I'm not talking to you anymore. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 24, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people. He shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Aaron didn't get to go into the promised land. Do you know why? He rebelled against the word of the Lord. Numbers 27, verse 14, for ye rebelled against my what? Let me read that again. For ye rebelled against my singular. One commandment. Ye rebelled against it. One thing out of the Bible that you, you made the decision, your flesh made the decision that you didn't like it, so you decided not to do it. 
You rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin and the strife of the congregation to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Meribah and Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. Deuteronomy 1, 26, notwithstanding, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. One commandment. One commandment. That was God saying to Israel, go in. One commandment. And they decided that they had the right to not obey God. Their flesh made that decision. Deuteronomy 1, 43, so I spake unto you, and you would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and went presumptuously up into the hill. You're presumptuous in thinking that it is okay if you don't obey one thing God said, but you are okay with the rest of it. Deuteronomy 9, 23, likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, go up and possess the land which I have given you, then you rebelled against the commandment, singular, of the Lord, your God, and you believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. It's all witchcraft. It's rebellion. Joshua 1, 18, whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death, only be strong and of a good courage. Psalm 66, 7. He ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. You know what that means? Rebellious people always like to brag about what they got away with. They always like to say, well, I don't have to do that. And I'm just as good a Christian as you are. Isaiah 1, 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nursed and brought up children. Young people, your mom and dad fed you. They bought you food. They bought you chips and dip and pizza and hamburgers and soda pop. And then they fixed your teeth because you rotted them out. They paid your dental bills. They fed you. They gave you the most expensive clothes because you demanded that. And you won't even get up and do what they told you to do. That's witchcraft, young people. It's witchcraft. And God hates it. And your mom and daddy, they're getting weary because you continue to be in rebellion and you act like you don't care. And that's church people too. So, I'm going to get beat up again this week. And be worried about my people. So Isaiah chapter 1, turn there in your Bibles and I'll quit preaching. If you open your Bibles up, I'll stop. Boy, I wish that had some force to it. Isaiah chapter 1. I love you. And I want to say I won't say that. I want to reason with you. And I want you to be reasonable. And I'm going to be reasonable. And I'm going to be long-suffering. And I'm going to be gentle. And I'm going to worry about you. And I'm not ever going to tell you that I'm worried about you. But I am. And I'm praying for you. But when I see... When I see rebellion... I can't just, 
I can't just act like it's not there. And I see it. It's in this church. So, sometimes I hide the worry and the depression, and sometimes I can't. And I will say thank you to all the people that have written and encouraged me to keep preaching this and to keep saying it. But there's rebellion in this church. And I want to reason you with you about it. Because though your sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow. It's not too late. It's not too late. There will come a time when it will be. But it's not too late. Come down, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing, see there's your will right there. Remember, your will, your spirit still wants to serve the Lord. And I believe that. But your flesh has made decisions that manifest rebellion. And it's not too late if you're still willing. You can be willing and obedient. Ye shall, look here, ye shall eat the good of the land. That's this right here. Not what I say, but this book, what it says. If you be willing and obedient, you, shall, you get access to this book. But if you're unwilling and disobedient, I promise you, I promise you, God will take this book away from you. And you won't recognize it when it happens. Because there's a whole church, a whole church, Wayne, that is openly endorsing sodomy. And they don't know that they're doing something wrong. They think that they're still honoring God. And they don't know it. That's like Samson getting his hair cut off and his strength departed, but he didn't know it. And see, what will happen is, this book, God will take it away from you and you won't eat from it anymore, but you won't know it. You won't know it. Verse 20, but if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with what? And what's the sword? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. All I did was read the Bible to you. You have to decide if it applies to you or not. You have to make that choice. I can't make it for you. If I could, I would have already. Because I love you that much. I do. You have no idea. <laughs> you know, sometimes I preach and I don't have people in mind. And then sometimes I preach... And I do. And you have no idea how much I love you. And how much I care about you. But I'm preaching right to you. And I want you to be reasonable about it. And only God. I said this four weeks ago. And I mean it. 
if God doesn't change you, I can't. And I realize that. But if God doesn't change you, you're not going to get to eat anymore. Let's bow our heads. Father, there's things I wanted to say and you didn't let me say it. And Lord, I hope that there were things that I shouldn't have said that you let me say. I hope that wasn't the case. Because I do not want to rebel against you. Even in preaching, I don't want to rebel against you. I do not want to be in the place of the Holy Spirit. But Father, we have rebellious ways. And that witchcraft is a work of the flesh and it's always going to come out. One way or the other, it's going to come out. It's going to be manifest. And it's hard to ignore. And I'm not ignoring it. I can't. Father, you know what I've wrestled with. You know what I've struggled with. You know what I've asked you in prayer. And you know how much I love these people that I'm talking to. They mean the world to me. And Lord, it's, it's like when my wife and I it's like when there's something between us. I hate it, God. I hate it. And what I want is just sweet, sweet times with my wife. I want us to love each other. I want us to be in love with one another. And I treasure, Lord, that sweet, sweet fellowship that she and I have together. Lord, that's how I see this church. It's like I have a wife, and I love these people, and I don't want anything between us. But I suspect that there is, and I don't know what to do about it, but I don't want it, because I want the sweet times with my people. You want that. So, Father, you either convict me, convict them, and change us, and make us do right, and live right, and be right. Because without that, we're going to rebel, and we're going to lose our Bibles. And that's all there is to it. God, I've seen it. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And I don't want it to happen to any of these people. And I don't want it to happen to me. So Father, I pray that you would help my people and you would help me. Let's get the rebellion and the witchcraft out. And let's turn back to submitting to the authority of your word in our lives. Thank you, Father, for helping us preach. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us today. Don't give up on us, God. We are rebellious in our nature, and we don't want to be. So God, help your people today. I pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, would you stand to your feet?